Born in the year 1903, during the early years of cinema, Georgian-born director Mikhail Kalatozov always knew he wanted to be a film director. From the age of 14, he started off as a driver for Tbilisi Film Studios and soon took on various roles such as a cameraman, film editor, writer and even an actor. Mikhail made his directorial debut towards the end of the silent era with Salt for Svanisha, which was released in the year 1930. It's an agitprop documentary about the harsh conditions faced by the people of the Ushko tribe who have not experienced modernization. The film's brilliance emerges from its cinematic complexity from the use of provoking imagery to generate a reaction from the audience to the daring camera angles and movement, shot sizes and composition. These reflect Mikhail's understanding of the camera which developed from his years of being a cameraman. This mix of surrealistic, realistic and innovative style of cinematography becomes a recurring style for Mikhail's later films. 1930 was also the year in which the Soviet montage movement came to an end in Russia and a new policy called socialist realism had emerged. It restricts complexity in films and only encouraged films that emphasized more on ideologies than style. These films had to revolve around a protagonist who sacrifices his desires for the good of his people, thus providing Soviets with a role model to follow. Socialist realism came to an end after Stalin's death in 1953. This period between 1953 to 1958 was known as the Thaw. It brought about a new movement known as New Humanism, a movement that placed emphasis on humanistic and ethical values and presented skeptical protagonists. New Humanism finally gave socialist realism a fix. Only then did Mikhail finally start making films that provided an accurate representation of the lives of the Soviets during the war. Mikhail Kalatozov's The Queens of Flying, released in 1957, was one of the key films that marked the start of a new subjective and personalized Soviet cinema. Mikhail's directing style was such that he gave the actors the freedom to exhibit their interpretation of the script. For him, film was always a means of revealing his artistic concept. He relied more on the film's aesthetics to bring across the story. All his main characters, regardless of the story, have the same underlying reason for their actions, and that is their hunger for liberation. Hence, he directs them to act with subdued emotions, a reflection of how they are restrained by their surroundings. It is only when all odds are against them that they start unleashing their internal angst and devastation through a dramatic outbreak of emotions and actions. This provides a greater impact to such scenes as the audiences see how broken the characters have become. Mikhail made most of his masterpieces in collaboration with cinematographer Sergei Yurozhevsky. The most predominant attributes of his visual style are the use of acrobatic long takes, tracks and pants. Such movements produce a seamless flow of images and heighten the realism of his films. This along with the use of great depth of field, and the layering of space distracts us from the boundaries of the screen. For example, in this scene when Veronica is running up the stairs upon the realization that the air raid has hit her building, the camera acts as her shadow, empathizing with her and going through this cruel revelation with her. The camera's successive motion throughout the long take of his films bring us through a journey with his characters and we explore the environment they're put in or reach a deeper level of understanding of their predicament. Mikhail also utilizes sharp camera angles to emphasize his character's emotional state of mind and bring out the expressiveness of the human figure. Dramatic compositions are also commonplace in his films. The use of space or rather the lack of use brings us a feeling of desolation and abandonment. These techniques give the character an identity, allowing the Soviet audiences back then to identify with them and see them as a reflection of themselves. Yurozhevsky's handheld camera work captures viscerally the emotional extremes which complement the melodramatic nature of Mikhail's film as well. For example, in this shot, the desperate farmer driven to his wit's end is seen chopping off all his sugar cane. The chaotic movement of the camera creates a dizzying effect, which is a reflection of its loss of hope, confusion, and anger towards God who throws hardships at him time and again. Kalatozov utilizes close-ups on his characters experiencing an internal conflict whether it's when they've reached a moment of realization, confusion, flood of emotion or grief, creating an isolation from the world. Extreme wide-angled shots are common in Kyle's films as they present the big picture in a more distorted way. This hints the destructive and dangerous nature of the environments the characters are placed in. The camera often passes the characters closely whilst avoiding them ever looking into it. This way, we catch a glimpse of the emotions running through a characters presented, very much like the way we would when walking past people in reality. Mikhail and Yurozhevsky share a common appreciation for nature, yet they recognize the cruelty of it too. 
This is reflected in the way his characters are usually pictured as tiny silhouettes against the vast landscapes. This puts forward a certain irony as his suffering characters are always put against a picturesque landscape, like a shadow that doesn't belong. In a way, these landscapes act as a window into the human psychology. The use of proportions here also emphasize the battle between man and nature. In the film The Letter Never Sends, the main enemy recognized is nature, and ironically, the characters are placed in the midst of it. An expressionistic means of lighting is used with a stark contrast between light and dark. Kalatozov uses this to set the mood of tragedy or highlight the grief tone of the situations he puts forward. In order to enhance realism, he mostly makes use of organic lighting and coloured filters that exaggerate contrasts and give the skies a dull outlook whilst keeping the sunny aspect. This reflects the gloomy atmosphere during the period of revolution and war. There is an idiosyncratic use of mise-en-scene in Mikhail's films. Water and snow are examples of elements of nature that are always present in his films. The fluidity and purity of water represents a temporary calmness of the characters. Hence, he uses this aspect to accentuate the positive energies of the characters. The snow brings about a feeling of innocence. However, ironically, it's also one of the causes of the character's demise in Mikhail's films. These elements are often juxtaposed by another prominent element in all his films, fire, an element capable of destroying anything and everything it touches. In the Unsense letter, superimpositions of fire appear to foreshadow the destruction that awaits. They are also used to signify the internal conflicts of the characters and the fire that fuels their passion. Animals are also a common symbol for the ruthlessness of mankind and for loyalty, conscience and freedom. They can be used as an allegory for the characters too. For example, in The Queens Are Flying Very Much Like The Queens, Veronica is propelled by her instincts and driven by her feelings. Also, elements like the ship in the red tent, the tent in the Unsense letter and the house in The Queens Are Flying are a symbol of unity and personal space for the characters. However, these personal spaces are often invaded by nature or aerate. This signifies the intrusion of public into private spaces. Mikhail prefers the seamless flow of camera movements. However, abrupt cuts are also widely used in his films. This is seen in I Am Cuba when the sweet tranquility of the river is interrupted by the cut of an American band playing booming music on the rooftop. This signifies the intrusion of the American mafia into Cuban territory before the revolution. He also utilizes parallel editing to create a certain irony or discontinuity. This can be seen during the rape scene in The Cranes Are Flying when there is a cut from Mark's feet to Boris's boots creating a symbolic continuity of space in a discontinuous cut, magnifying the motive of betrayal. Rapid fast cuts are also used to heighten attention and bring about a sense of uneasiness to the audience. An example is this scene when Veronica is on a run to commit suicide. The montage of feet, fans, smoke and snow are cut so rapidly that it creates an uneasy tension. The cut to the train horn is a symbol for her to snap back to reality. Superimpositions and dissolves are widely used to bring about the feeling of nostalgia from the characters and their yearning for someone. When Boris dies, triple exposure and the swirling of the camera depict the future he'll never have. One of the key themes that drive his films is love. He portrays love as pure and innocent as the waters, sometimes in a manner of childish exuberance or as a form of awakening sensuality and these act as a key motivation for the character's actions. This is reflected through the love between Boris and Veronica when they skip off into a timeless presence in The Cranes Are Flying or Andre and Tanya's childlike portrayal of their affection for each other in the Unsense Letter. Such scenes bridge us to the characters as we've either experienced such untainted romantic moments with another before or we yearn to. However, the love portrayed at the start frequently foreshadows the destruction of innocence and purity. This is seen from how Veronica's life turns upside down after Boris's departure into the war Front. It is also seen when Andre and Tanya's romantic conversations evolve into more humanistic issues when Andre's injuries start to hinder their journey. His films present blissful, fleeting moments of love and how they harvest into tragic forms of what they once were, leaving the audience sympathizing with these characters. Another theme present in his films is betrayal. It is through this act that the true personalities of his characters are revealed. Betrayal comes in many forms for his characters. For example, when Mark betrays his cousin Boris by acting on his feelings for Veronica in The Cranes Are Flying, his disloyal, selfish, impulsive and sly attributes are revealed and he turns into a revolting character. As for Veronica, though she's committed the same offence, she's forgiven and she's recognised as a vulnerable character due to the tragedy she suffered. The film was one of the first to refuse to pass judgement on such a character, thus opening the window for the Soviet audiences to start forming their own judgements. 
Similarly, the red tent revolves around General Nobile who's lived in guilt for years after abandoning his crew in the Arctic and it questions whether the motive for his actions make him a betrayer or not. The film does not tell us the final verdict, rather it leads us to judge the characters ourselves. Betrayal does not only exist amongst people in his films, it also exists between nature and people. The betrayal of forces beyond our control reflects the lack of control people had over the war and how they had to deal with whatever harsh conditions that came their way. Kalatozov's films always carry a socialist theme, and that is, self-sacrifice is a great thing if it's for the country. Many of his films involve the abandonment of a comrade who's slowing down the crew in order to accomplish a mission. It is precisely this that questions our morality, if it's worth sacrificing another for the greater good. The quality of hope is also another prominent theme in his films. He teases his characters with glimpses of hope which are later revealed to be nothing but disillusionment, thus breaking the characters further. If we observe Mikhail's films, we see that the living characters of his films experience internal and external turmoil throughout their lives after a tragic occurrence, while the ones who have escaped this turmoil are those whose lives are cut short. This gives us an idea of what it was like to live during the period of war. Even the dead had more of a life to live as compared to the living. Another theme prominent in his films is religion. When the characters are faced with desperate situations, religion is often brought up. They turn to God for an answer, waiting for a miracle to save them or a sign of proof that he exists and is looking out for them. But they are often proven wrong. For his films, we see that he's agreeable of the idea of finding comfort in God. However, it's evident that he doesn't believe in God being the solution or saving grace to any situation. This is shown in the irony he puts forward in the scene of Maria wearing a crucifix around her neck as she sells herself to men. In conclusion, Mikhail Kalatozov was a visionary and was never afraid to deform and distort materials to produce a certain effect. His films narrated honestly what he knew and had observed, and with such simple stories, he brought forward a complexity to them with his dynamic and romantic cinematic language. Every aspect of his film was a shift from conventional paradigms and it was precisely that that revived the Soviet streets. Vámonos mi guajira, vámonos para La Habana, vámonos mi guajira, arranca...